In the ancient land of Greece, more than two millennia ago, a blind poet named Homer, along with the most renowned authors, playwrights, and historians of their time, would record the magnificent tales we now know as Greek mythology. These stories would speak of mighty heroes and powerful gods who shaped the destiny of the land. But before these tales could be told, there was only chaos, a great void of emptiness. From the chaos emerged Gaia, the earth, and Eros, the embodiment of love. They were joined by night and day, who brought an end to Erebus, the darkness, with the eternal cycle of dusk and dawn. Finally, Tartarus came into existence, the deepest abyss within the earth. In this primordial world, Cronus patiently waited for his chance to overthrow his father, Uranus. When the opportunity came, he castrated Uranus, and from the severed genitals, Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty, was born. Zeus, one of Cronus's sons, was saved from being devoured by his father and was raised by his grandmother Gaia on Mount Ida in Crete. He would later lead a ten-year war against the Titans, releasing the hundred-handed giants and the legendary Cyclops craftsmen from the depths of the earth. After defeating the Titans, Zeus imprisoned them in Tartarus, where they would suffer for eternity. Atlas, who had led the Titans in battle, was given a particularly harsh punishment by Zeus. However, Themis, the titan of law and order, and her son Prometheus managed to escape punishment. Prometheus, one of the few titans spared, decided to create humanity. He fashioned man from clay and gifted them with fire, allowing them to emerge from their caves and become rulers of the earth. Zeus, however, was not pleased with Prometheus's actions and demanded animal sacrifices from mankind for each meal. In defiance, Prometheus killed a bull and divided it into two parts, offering Zeus the juicy meat and Hera the bare bones. This enraged Zeus, who took away the gift of fire from humanity. As punishment, Zeus chained Prometheus to a mountain, where an eagle would feast on his liver each day for millennia. The torment seemed endless. Festus, the god of smiths, shaped the first woman from clay at the request of Aphrodite and Zeus. Hermes, the messenger god, bestowed upon her the gift of speech. This woman, named Pandora, was given a sealed box by the gods, with strict instructions never to open it. For a time, Pandora and Epimetheus, the brother of Prometheus, lived happily together, exploring the wonders of nature. They even had a daughter named Pyrrha who brought them great joy. But Pandora's curiosity eventually got the better of her and she couldn't resist opening the forbidden box. To her horror, it released all the evils that Prometheus had kept away from humanity. With the release of these evils, mankind was forever changed. They would no longer enjoy eternal youth and would grow arrogant and cruel. This drew the wrath of Zeus, who unleashed a great flood upon the world. The deluge wiped out all of humanity. In the aftermath, as the waters receded and the earth became calm once again, it was left devoid of human life. Only two survivors, Deucanian and Pyrrha, remained. They beseeched the gods for guidance on how to rebuild humanity. Their prayers were answered when the titan Themis was sent to guide them. Humanity was born anew, but this time they would be protected by a tool of ultimate security Nord's ultimate security package. With features like a data breach scanner, ad blocker, privacy tools, a cross-platform password manager, dark web monitoring, 24-7 customer support, and access to the fastest VPN on the market, their digital privacy would be safeguarded. Under Zeus's rule from Mount Olympus, he controlled all weather changes and had seven wives during his reign. His first wife, Metis, became pregnant with his child, but Zeus, fearing a prophecy that the child would overthrow him, swallowed Metis before she could give birth. This act caused Zeus a terrible headache and he asked for his head to be split open. From the split head emerged his daughter Athena, who would go on to become one of the Olympian gods. Athena's aunt, Themis, a titan of justice and law, had betrayed her own kind to side with the gods during their war against the titans. Her three children, known as the Fates, were responsible for weaving the threads of life that determined each individual's destiny. Zeus, with his insatiable desire, fathered many gods and goddesses with various mortal women. He often disguised himself to seduce women who caught his eye. One such woman was Europa, 
the princess of Tyre and sister to the famous hero Cadmus. Zeus transformed himself into a magnificent white bull to approach her, and Europa bore him many children. The continent of Europe was named in her honor. Hera, the protector of marriage and women, was also one of the most vengeful and spiteful gods on Mount Olympus. When she discovered Zeus's infidelity with Io, she demanded that he gift her a white cow as a present and locked Io in a cave, guarded by Argus, a monster with many eyes. Io's plight did not go unnoticed by Hermes, the master musician. He played his pipes and sang lullabies to the monster Argus, lulling him to sleep. Hermes then used his sword to slay the beast, freeing Io from her prison. Eventually, Io would find her way to the Nile in Egypt, far from Hera's wrath, and Zeus would finally restore her human form. Leto, another lover of Zeus, experienced the full extent of Hera's jealous rage. She fled across Greece in a desperate search for refuge. After nine days of agonizing labor, the other goddesses took pity on Leto and allowed her to give birth to twins, Apollo and Artemis. These siblings would grow up to become fully-fledged gods of Olympus. Queen Niobe, whose beauty was matched only by her arrogance, mocked Leto for having only two children. As punishment, Apollo and Artemis would kill all of Niobe's sons and daughters, leaving her alone in despair, begging the gods to end her pain. Apollo, known as the god of prophecy, embarked on a journey to Mount Parnassus, accompanied by a great snake named Python. He slew the serpent and constructed a great temple where its body fell, which would become the famous Oracle of Delphi. Filled with pride after his victory, Apollo declared himself the greatest archer to have ever lived. This declaration drew the ire of Eros, the god of love, who swore revenge against Apollo. Eros followed Apollo to the river Peneus, where he spotted Daphne, the river's daughter. Using his arrows, Eros made Apollo fall madly in love with Daphne, but also made Daphne feel nothing but disgust towards Apollo. In his pursuit of Daphne, Apollo used his powers to make laurel trees evergreen and carried a laurel wreath wherever he went to mourn his lost love. Apollo's most important child, Asclepius, became a famous physician who could bring the dead back to life. In response, Zeus killed Asclepius with a thunderbolt, but later resurrected him, making Asclepius the god of healing and medicine. Artemis, the goddess of the moon, was quick to anger and fiercely protected her chastity. Her brother Poseidon, the god of the seas and earthquakes, once punished King Minos of Crete for refusing to sacrifice his best bull to him. In response, Zeus punished Poseidon and Apollo by sending them to serve King Laomedon of Troy. There, they were tasked with building the city's famous walls. Athena, the goddess of war and wisdom, was known for her love of strategists and cunning heroes. She often aided them in their great quests. However, she was also a proud goddess who sought to stake her claim on the world. Athena had a fondness for music and art, inventing the trumpet and the flute. She was particularly proud of her skill in weaving, which would lead to a fateful encounter with Arachne. Arachne, a skilled weaver herself, challenged Athena to a weaving contest. Athena accepted, and the competition was fierce. In the end, Athena's tapestry depicted the gods in a favorable light, while Arachne's portrayed them in a mocking and disrespectful manner. Enraged by Arachne's arrogance, Athena struck her on the head and turned her into the first spider. Arachnids would be named in her honor. Aphrodite, the goddess of love and beauty, emerged from Uranus's genitals and was often accompanied by Eros, who shot arrows into the hearts of potential lovers. One such individual was Narcissus, a beautiful young man burdened with vanity and arrogance. When the nymph Echo approached Narcissus, he rejected her. However, Nemesis, the goddess of vengeance, saw this and intervened. The next time Narcissus gazed at his reflection in a lake, he fell in love with himself. He stared at his own reflection for weeks until he could no longer bear it, and decided to take a dagger and plunge it into his heart. From his blood, a beautiful flower, the first Narcissus, bloomed. Pygmalion, a great artist from the island of Cyprus, had given up on women after years of unlucky love. He decided to create a statue of a woman, and when he finished, he was struck by its beauty. 
Pygmalion prayed to the gods for a woman as perfect as his statue, and to his amazement, the stone figure transformed into a woman of flesh and blood. Aphrodite had answered Pygmalion's prayers, and he embraced his newfound love, Galatea, with joy. Aphrodite delighted in helping young couples find love but was also a vain and jealous goddess. She would take revenge against those who stole the spotlight from her. Psyche, a mortal woman of extraordinary beauty, was admired by all but drew the jealousy of Aphrodite. Psyche's journey would lead her to a magnificent palace where she became the bride of a mysterious husband she was forbidden to see. Overjoyed with her new life, Psyche spent her days exploring the palace's beautiful gardens. However, one day, her curiosity got the better of her, and she lost her grip on an oil lamp, burning her husband, who turned out to be Eros, the god of love. Psyche, determined to reunite with Eros, sought Aphrodite's help. The goddess set her impossible tasks, including a journey to the underworld. Psyche's trials would ultimately lead to her reunion with Eros, and she would become immortal. Their love would be celebrated for eternity. Festus, the god of smiths, was born lame, and his mother, Hera, threw him off Olympus into the sea to drown. But he survived and became the god of pleasure, bringing joy to mortals. Aphrodite, the most beautiful of the Olympian gods, was married to Hephaestus, a great inventor who fashioned many of the palaces on Olympus and the equipment of the gods. Hephaestus created Athena's breastplate, Hermes's winged helmet and sandals, and Helios's chariot. Ares, the god of war, had a long-term affair with Aphrodite, the wife of Hephaestus. When Hephaestus discovered their infidelity, he devised an invisible net to trap them in bed together. This embarrassing incident exposed their affair to the other gods. Ares, however, was not content with only Aphrodite. He also had an affair with Eos, the goddess of the dawn. Eos fell in love with a young Trojan prince named Tithonus, whom she begged Zeus to make immortal. Her wish was granted, but she forgot to ask for eternal youth for Tithonus. As a result, he aged until he was unable to move, becoming the first cicada an insect known for its long lifespan and early morning songs. Hermes, the messenger god and patron of thieves, was known as a trickster among the gods. He once gave birth to a child, Pan, who had the appearance of a hideous monster with horns and hooves. Pan's mother, Dryope, was horrified, but Hermes took his child to Mount Olympus, where the gods were intrigued by his appearance and adored him. Dionysus, the god of wine and parties, was born when his mother, Semele, asked Zeus to appear in his true form. Zeus placed the infant in his thigh until he was fully grown, and Dionysus became one of the most beloved gods in Greece. King Midas was granted the power to turn anything he touched into gold after saving a close friend of Dionysus. However, this gift quickly turned into a curse when everything Midas touched transformed into gold, including his own daughter. Desperate to undo the curse, Midas sought Dionysus's help and was eventually relieved of his golden touch. Above all else, Demeter was the goddess of farming, ensuring bountiful harvests and fertile lands. However, her daughter, Persephone, caught the eye of Hades, the god of the underworld. Hades abducted Persephone, causing Demeter to search desperately for her. After learning the truth from Helios, the sun god, Demeter refused to allow the earth to bear fruit until her daughter was returned. Zeus intervened and ordered Hades to release Persephone. However, a compromise was struck, and Persephone was allowed to return to the world of the living but only for part of the year. During her absence, Demeter mourned, causing winter, and when Persephone returned, spring and summer would flourish once more. Hades ruled the kingdom of the dead alongside Persephone. Thanatos, the god of death, commanded the process of dying itself. Sharon guided the souls of the deceased across the river Styx to the underworld, where Cerberus, the three-headed dog, stood guard. In the underworld's court, three judges determined the fate of each soul. Depending on their judgment, souls would be directed to one of three paths, the fields of Asphodel, the eternal paradise of Elysium, or the deepest depths of Tartarus. Sisyphus, for tricking the gods, faced the eternal punishment of rolling a boulder up a steep hill, only to have it slip from his grasp each time. Murdering a family member was considered a grave sin in Greek society. 
Even if the murderer were still alive, the Furies, three sisters from the underworld, would hunt them down and torment them relentlessly. The field of mourning was a resting place for those who had spent their lives pursuing love but had been rejected. Orpheus, a renowned musician and poet, fell in love with the beautiful Eurydice. Tragically, on their wedding day, she died from a snake bite. Orpheus, determined to reunite with his beloved, ventured into the underworld to retrieve her. With his enchanting music, he persuaded Hades to release Eurydice under one condition. He must not look back at her until they had reached the world of the living. Heroes of the heroic age began to emerge, embarking on legendary adventures. One of the first heroes of this generation was Cadmus, who embarked on a quest to find his sister Europa. Cadmus followed a sacred cow and found the city of Thebes, where he faced various challenges and founded one of the greatest cities of ancient Greece. Cadmus's adventures continued, involving a dragon, a curse, and a complicated family history. He would become a key figure in the lineage of heroes and gods. Perseus, the son of Danae and Zeus, grew up to be a hero known for his daring quest to slay the Gorgon Medusa. Medusa, once a beautiful maiden dedicated to Athena, was cursed and transformed into a monster. Her gaze turned anyone who looked upon her into stone. Perseus embarked on a treacherous journey to obtain Medusa's head, guided by the nymphs of the Garden of the Hesperides. With the help of winged sandals, a reflective shield, and a bag provided by the gods, Perseus infiltrated Medusa's lair and successfully decapitated her, turning her head to stone in his magical bag. During his journey, Perseus encountered the beautiful Andromeda, whom he saved from a sea monster. As a reward Andromeda's parents offered her hand in marriage to Perseus, and the two began their life together. Returning to his homeland of Seriphos, Perseus confronted King Polydectes, who had mistreated his mother, Danae. In anger, Perseus revealed Medusa's head, turning Polydectes and his soldiers to stone. Perseus then gave the Gorgon's head to Athena, who placed it on her shield. The tale of Perseus, the hero who had slain the Gorgon Medusa, was but the beginning of a grand and interconnected tapestry of Greek mythology. As the story goes, Perseus, hailed as a hero, was destined to face trials that would test his mettle and shape the destiny of those around him. One fateful day, Perseus participated in a discus-throwing competition, showcasing his incredible strength. However, fate had a cruel twist in store for him. In his moment of triumph, he hurled the discus with such force that it veered off course striking an unfortunate member of the audience. This tragic accident fulfilled an ominous prophecy that Perseus's own actions would lead to the death of his grandfather. Zeus, the king of the gods, observed this unfolding drama from his throne atop Mount Olympus. His attention was drawn to Alchemina, the beautiful granddaughter of Perseus, who descended to earth. Zeus's heart was stirred, and he descended in human form to be with her. Their union bore fruit as Alchemina soon found herself pregnant with a son, who would later be known as Heracles, or Hercules to the Romans. Meanwhile, Hera, ever resentful of her husband Zeus's infidelity, used her divine magic to interfere with the birth of Heracles. She delayed his birth while expediting the arrival of Eurystheus, another descendant of Perseus. Hera's manipulation forced Zeus's hand leading him to bestow the kingship upon Eurystheus instead of Heracles, in what was a form of revenge against Hera herself. When Heracles was finally born, a celestial event unfolded. As he suckled from his mother's breast, his milk sprayed across the heavens, forming what we now know as the Milky Way. This divine spectacle marked the arrival of a figure who would become both a symbol of unparalleled strength and a tragic hero plagued by inner demons. As Heracles grew, his prodigious abilities were evident to all. He was trained by some of Greece's most renowned masters, gaining expertise in everything from archery to music. However, his incredible strength was accompanied by a short temper that made him a perilous presence to both friends and foes alike. One tragic incident marred his journey to heroism. During a music lesson with his teacher Linus, Heracles's temper flared, and he struck Linus fatally with his instrument. This act of violence left Heracles with the guilt of having taken a life, a burden he would carry with him for years to come. Heracles went on to marry Megara, the Theban princess, 
and they had three children together. However, the vengeful Hera, still harboring resentment for her husband's illegitimate son, devised a cruel plan. She drove Heracles to madness, compelling him to murder his own wife and children in a fit of madness. It was a horrendous act that would haunt him forever, for the killing of a family member was considered one of the gravest crimes in ancient Greece. Haunted by the ghosts of his past, Heracles sought solace and guidance. His only hope lay in the revered oracle of Delphi, a place where seekers of wisdom and redemption turned for answers. However, his path to redemption would not be easy. King Eurystheus, jealous of Heracles's abilities and resentful of his past, devised a cunning plan. He ordered Heracles to undertake ten labors, tasks that seemed insurmountable, each one more perilous than the last. Heracles's first labor was to confront the Nemean lion, a fearsome creature whose golden hide was impervious to weapons. After months of rigorous training, Heracles confronted the lion, wrestling with it until he heard the sickening sound of its neck snapping. The lion's pelt would later become a symbol of his strength. The second labor brought him face to face with the Lenian Hydra, a water serpent with nine venomous heads. Hera, ever the schemer, added a new layer of difficulty by placing a giant crab in the lake where the Hydra dwelled. Heracles, undaunted, fought valiantly, decapitating the beast and searing its necks with fire to prevent their regeneration. As a testament to his victory, the constellation Cancer was born in the night sky. Heracles's trials continued, as he was tasked with capturing the Serenian hind, a lightning-fast creature. He followed this by capturing the Aramanthian boar, but his cousin Eurystheus remained unsatisfied, stoking Heracles's frustration. During his quest to capture the Aramanthian boar, Heracles sought shelter with his friend Pholus, a centaur. Their peaceful gathering was disrupted when the centaur Nessus attempted to abduct Heracles's wife, Diana. A fierce battle ensued, resulting in Nessus's death. Unbeknownst to Heracles, Nessus had survived, nursing his wounds and plotting a terrible revenge. The labor to clean the Aegean stables, a task most considered impossible, became Heracles's sixth trial. But with his legendary determination, he succeeded by diverting two rivers to cleanse the filth. Despite his success, King Eurystheus, ever the antagonist, refused to acknowledge this labor as valid. Next came the task of driving away the Stymphalian birds, ferocious creatures with iron beaks and poisonous droppings. Heracles's seventh labor led him to King Minos and the enigmatic Minotaur, a half-man, half bull monstrosity imprisoned within a labyrinth. Heracles's eighth labor took him to Diomedes, the Thracian king whose horses were as aggressive as they were deadly, fed on human flesh. Heracles was undeterred and managed to subdue the beasts. His ninth labor was a confrontation with the Amazons to obtain their queen's girdle. Though the task appeared perilous, Heracles was surprised by their hospitality. Hera, ever watchful, intervened once more, causing discord that led to bloodshed. In his rage, Heracles slew the queen, Hippolyta, securing the girdle. The tenth labor saw Heracles venture to the land of Erethea, tasked with capturing the cattle of the three-headed giant Gerion. Before his departure, he made a bold threat to the sun itself, threatening to shoot it down. The sun god Helios appeared and placated Heracles, promising to shine less intensely during his journey. Heracles's journey to obtain the golden apples from the Garden of the Hesperides marked his eleventh labor. However, the garden's location remained a mystery. Seeking guidance, he freed Prometheus, who suggested enlisting the aid of Atlas, the titan who held up the sky as punishment. Heracles brokered a deal, briefly relieving Atlas of his burden to retrieve the apples. Finally, his twelfth labor tasked him with capturing Cerberus, the formidable three-headed dog guarding the gates of the underworld. Heracles wrestled with the beast until it was exhausted, successfully bringing it to the surface and back to the world of the living. Upon his return to King Eurystheus, Heracles was granted a pardon for his past crimes, finding solace and redemption at last. But Heracles's adventures were far from over. The Argonauts, having embarked on their epic journey alongside Jason, found themselves facing yet another formidable obstacle on the island of Crete. Here, they encountered Talos, 
a menacing bronze giant that tirelessly patrolled the shores, relentlessly destroying any ship that dared to approach. In their darkest hour, it was the sorcery of Medea that would save them. She summoned her magic, weaving a spell that rendered Talos immortal, thus ending his destructive rampage. Jason, fueled by his longing to reclaim his homeland, had set his sights on Iolcus. However, upon his return, he was confronted by a grim reality King Peleus had put his father to death in his absence, and the city was now under the rule of a ruthless tyrant. Medea, ever the cunning strategist, devised a plan for vengeance, one that would ensure Jason's ascent to the throne. In a cruel twist of fate, this plan would succeed all too well. Upon Medea's return to Iolcus, a horrifying sight awaited her. She found Jason's own daughters brutally murdering their father, King Peleus, following her dark scheme to gain control of the kingdom. The plan had worked to perfection, but the consequences were far grimmer than anticipated. Now, Jason was poised to take his rightful place on the throne of Iolcus. However, King Peleus's son, Acastus, soon uncovered Medea's role in his father's gruesome murder. Fueled by anger and the thirst for vengeance, Acastus drove Jason and Medea from the city, their once promising future in ruins. With their dreams shattered, Jason and Medea sought refuge in the city of Corinth, where they hoped to rebuild their lives. Yet, the shadows of their past actions cast a long and haunting presence over them. Jason, forever haunted by the knowledge of the cursed robe that had brought about Medea's downfall, often visited the Argo, the legendary ship that had carried them on their quests. But one fateful day, as he lay beneath the rotting stern of the ship, tragedy struck. The wooden structure collapsed upon him, crushing him beneath its weight. Medea, in her newfound life as queen of Athens after fleeing Corinth, faced her own challenges. Her rise to power, initially marked by success, was soon met with opposition. Theseus, the offspring of two mortal men with the divine blood of Poseidon coursing through his veins, had come into his own as a powerful hero. Possessing remarkable agility and strength, Theseus became a beacon of hope for those in need. Raised by hunters and tutored by centaurs, he was destined for greatness. As Theseus reached manhood, he embarked on a journey to claim his father's possessions. Medea, the new queen of Athens, saw this as an opportunity to eliminate a potential threat. She dispatched Theseus to face the formidable bull of Marathon, confident that the beast would spell his doom. To her dismay, Theseus emerged victorious, dispatching the bull with ease and returning to Athens in triumph. Medea, relentless in her pursuit of power, resorted to treachery once more. She offered Theseus a poisoned cup of wine, intent on eliminating him. However, her plans were thwarted by Aegeus, the king of Athens, who recognized the sword and sandals of his son, saving Theseus from the deadly plot. Frustrated by her repeated failures, Medea returned to her homeland of Colchis, where she sought reconciliation with her father, who had been sorely disappointed by her previous actions. Meanwhile, a new chapter in the realm of heroes and legends was unfolding. King Aeneas and Queen Althea of Caledon were blessed with a son, Meliger, who, unbeknownst to them, carried the divine blood of the war god Ares within him. This divine lineage would grant Meliger immense power and bravery qualities that would become evident in the trials ahead. Caledon was soon plagued by a monstrous boar, a creature of immense size and ferocity that rampaged through the kingdom, leaving destruction in its wake. The boar's relentless attacks tore through towns, trampled crops, and claimed the lives of those unfortunate enough to cross its path. Desperate for a solution, King Aeneas sent messengers bearing an urgent plea to the far reaches of Greece. The call was clear, gather the greatest heroes of the land to join in a hunt to slay the beast. Among the heroes who answered the call was Atlanta, a remarkable woman who had been nurtured and protected by a bear, raised by hunters, and had become one of the greatest archers in the land. Her prowess in combat, speed, and marksmanship surpassed that of many men. Yet, when she offered to join the hunt, she was met with mockery and contempt from her fellow warriors. Only Meliger, captivated by her grace and courage, passionately argued for her inclusion in the heroic endeavor. Atlanta's unparalleled skill with the bow proved pivotal in the hunt for the Caledonian boar. With a well-aimed iron-tipped arrow, 
she struck the beast down, and Meliger delivered the fatal blow with a spear through its heart. However, their triumph would be marred by tragedy. Meliger's uncles, Toxius and Plexippus, driven by jealousy and greed, demanded that the boar's hide be awarded to them instead of Meliger's fellow hunters. Meliger, unable to tolerate their unjust claims, drew his sword and struck down his own uncles, a grim reminder of the complexities of heroism and familial ties. As the hunters prepared to return to Caledon, word reached Queen Althea that her son, Meliger, had achieved a great victory. Overwhelmed by emotions, she rushed to meet her son, but the story took a dark turn. A hidden secret from the past would cast a shadow over their reunion. Long ago, Queen Althea had received a mysterious prophecy that foretold her son's fate. She had hidden a large log in the depths of her palace, a log destined to consume itself when her son's life was in danger. Upon hearing of Meliger's victory and fearing for his life, she made the heart-wrenching decision to throw the log into the fire, sealing her son's fate. Meliger's life, once marked by heroism and promise, was now extinguished by the very actions of his mother. Atlanta, whom he had come to admire and love, was left to mourn his loss. The tale of Atlanta, however, did not end with the slaying of the boar. She became the center of another legendary story, one involving a foot race that would change her life forever. A young man named Hippomenes challenged her to a race, and the prize was three golden apples bestowed by Aphrodite herself. The race was a thrilling contest of skill and strategy, and in the end, Hippomenes emerged victorious, earning the hand of Atlanta in marriage. Atlanta and Hippomenes, now united in matrimony, embarked on a new chapter of their lives. Yet, their happiness was tempered by the knowledge that they owed their union to Aphrodite's golden apples. However, fate was not finished weaving its intricate web. In their newfound bliss, Atlanta and Hippomenes overlooked a crucial act of gratitude offering proper sacrifice to Aphrodite for her divine aid. The goddess, slighted by their oversight, chose to remind them of her power. One day, while they sought solace within a sacred temple of Zeus, the king of the gods, Aphrodite imposed her judgment. She compelled Atlanta and Hippomenes to engage in an intimate act within the temple, an act that violated its sanctity. Zeus, witnessing the desecration of his temple, punished the couple for their transgression. Their punishment was a transformation into lions, condemned to roam the wild as powerful yet tragic beasts, forever separated from their human existence. As the generations passed, the heroes of old made way for a new era of heroes, as Zeus grew wary of the ever-increasing number of demigods on earth. The kingdom of Troy, ruled by King Priam and Queen Hecuba, stood as the most prominent and powerful of all. Their eldest son, Prince Hector, was celebrated as a paragon of honor and bravery. Devoted to his homeland and family, Hector was held in the highest esteem. Zeus, ever the fickle and unpredictable deity, had a penchant for interfering in the affairs of mortals. His latest dalliance had been with Queen Leda of Sparta, whom he had seduced by transforming into a magnificent swan. From this union, she bore two sets of twins, Castor and Pollux, and Clytemnestra and Helen. The divine blood that flowed through their veins destined them for extraordinary fates. Yet, it was the goddess of discord and strife, Eris, who would set in motion a chain of events that would shake the foundations of the mortal world. Eris, with her malevolent gift of chaos, sowed discord among the gods, sparking a fierce rivalry. The dispute escalated until Zeus, reluctant to take sides, decided to delegate the responsibility of judgment to a mortal prince Paris of Troy. Athena, Hera, and Aphrodite, each vying for his favor, presented Paris with distinct offers. Athena pledged to make him the king of Europe and Asia, promising wisdom and skill in war. Hera offered dominion over vast lands and the power of a mighty ruler. Aphrodite, however, dangled the most irresistible prize before him the love of the most beautiful woman in the world. Paris, lured by the intoxicating allure of Aphrodite's offer, chose the goddess of love as the victor. Little did he know that his decision would set into motion a chain of events that would lead to the legendary Trojan War. Helen, renowned far and wide for her unparalleled beauty, arrived in Troy as the object of desire for countless men. Among those who sought her hand in marriage was Menelaus, 
king of Mycenae. Helen's choice was made, and she wed Menelaus, becoming queen of Mycenae. However, the gods were not content to let fate unfold without their influence. One exception was Eris, the goddess of discord and strife, who reveled in chaos. She alone was not invited to the wedding, and in her spite she cast a golden apple among the guests. The apple bore an inscription, For the fairest. The rivalry that ensued among the goddesses Athena, Hera, and Aphrodite over the title of the fairest led to jealousy and resentment. Their feud escalated until Zeus, hoping to avoid further divine conflict, delegated the task of judgment to a mortal prince Paris of Troy. Each goddess offered Paris a unique reward in exchange for his decision. Athena vowed to grant him wisdom and strategic prowess in war. Hera promised him dominion over vast realms and the glory of a powerful ruler. Aphrodite, however, tempted him with the most enchanting of promises the love of the most beautiful woman in the world. Paris, seduced by Aphrodite's offer, awarded her the golden apple, declaring her the fairest. This decision would set the stage for a series of events that would culminate in the legendary Trojan War, a conflict that would shake the very foundations of the ancient world. Menelaus, the aggrieved husband, was informed of Helen's abduction and her presence in Troy. Consumed by anger and the need to reclaim his wife, he rallied his armies and called upon the oaths of all Helen's former suitors. These vows bound them to stand by his side in this time of need, and thus began the call to arms. The Greek forces assembled under the command of Agamemnon, and their fleet sailed for Troy, seeking vengeance and the return of Helen. The Trojan War, a conflict of epic proportions, had begun, pitting the mighty Greeks against the powerful Trojans. The war would rage on for nine long years, with both sides enduring untold hardships, sacrifices, and losses. The heroes of the age, including the indomitable Achilles, the wise Odysseus, and the valiant Ajax the Greater and Ajax the Lesser, would join the fray, their destinies entwined with the unfolding drama of the war. Achilles, born in the underworld and granted immortality by being submerged in the waters of the river Styx, was a warrior of unparalleled strength and prowess. However, his one vulnerability was a fateful heel that remained exposed. As the war raged on, a peculiar obstacle arose. The wind ceased to blow, and the Greek fleet found itself stranded, unable to set sail for Troy. Agamemnon consulted an oracle, which revealed that the winds could only be restored through a most grievous sacrifice the life of his eldest daughter, Iphigenia. Agamemnon, torn between familial love and the needs of his people, made the heart-wrenching decision to sacrifice his own daughter. Iphigenia's life was taken at the altar of Artemis, appeasing the goddess and releasing the winds from her grasp. With the winds at their backs, the Greek fleet finally set sail for Troy, their resolve steeled by vengeance and the desire to see Helen returned. However, as the heroes of Greece prepared for battle, they were unaware of the many trials and tribulations that lay ahead. In the midst of the war, Aeneas, the son of Aphrodite and cousin to the royal family of Troy, emerged as a formidable figure. His destiny would be forever intertwined with the fate of Troy, as he fought fiercely to protect his homeland from the encroaching Greek forces. The Trojans, too, were not without their own champions, and one among them was the valiant Prince Hector. Known for his unwavering devotion to Troy, his sense of honor, and his bravery in battle, Hector became a symbol of hope for his people. Yet, even as the heroes of Greece and Troy clashed on the battlefield, the gods themselves were divided by the conflict. Athena, ever the patron of warriors and strategy, supported the Greek cause, while Aphrodite, who had influenced the war's inception, championed the Trojan side. The struggle between the divine forces further fueled the flames of war, as the gods sought to influence the outcome according to their favor. In the heart of the besieged city of Troy, Queen Hecuba, a wise and compassionate ruler, watched as the city she loved faced its greatest challenge. Her husband, King Priam, remained resolute in the face of adversity, determined to protect their beloved homeland from the invading Greeks. As the war raged on, Prince Hector, their eldest son and Troy's greatest hero, took to the battlefield day after day, defending his people with unwavering courage. Hector's deeds of valor and his commitment to his family 
and city earned him the admiration and respect of both Trojans and Greeks alike. Yet the gods, ever capricious in their actions, had woven a web of destiny that would ultimately lead to Hector's tragic fate. A prophecy foretold that the walls of Troy would not fall as long as the city possessed the Palladium, a sacred statue of Athena. Determined to secure victory, the Greek hero Odysseus and his cunning accomplice Diomedes hatched a plan to infiltrate Troy and steal the Palladium. Disguised as beggars, Odysseus and Diomedes gained entry to the city and, through a clever ruse, managed to acquire the Palladium. Unbeknownst to them, their actions set in motion a chain of events that would hasten the downfall of Troy. As the Greeks continued their relentless assault on the city, Hector's sister, the prophetic princess Cassandra, delivered warnings of impending doom. However, her prophecies were often dismissed as the ravings of madness, and her pleas for the Trojans to take heed went unheeded. The war dragged on, and both sides suffered immeasurable losses. The heroes of Greece, driven by their oath to Menelaus and their desire for vengeance, fought with unparalleled determination. Among them, the indomitable Achilles stood as a formidable force, his strength and skill unmatched. Yet, Achilles bore a vulnerability known to all his Achilles' heel, the one part of his body that could be harmed. The Trojans, led by Hector's unwavering leadership, defended their city with resilience and honor. Hector's love for his wife, Andromache, and their young son, Astyanax, provided him with the strength to endure the brutal realities of war. Even as the conflict raged, the bonds of family and duty remained paramount in Hector's heart. As the years wore on, the once great city of Troy began to show the scars of war. Its walls, once impervious, crumbled under the relentless siege of the Greeks. The gods themselves, divided in their support, watched with both fascination and sorrow as the mortal world was consumed by violence and strife. Throughout this tumultuous period, Prince Paris of Troy, the catalyst for the war, faced the consequences of his actions. Despite his love for Helen, the Greek woman who had become his wife, Paris was haunted by the knowledge that his choices had brought untold suffering to both his people and the Greeks. Amid the chaos, Paris sought to prove his worth as a warrior and protect his beloved city. He faced formidable adversaries on the battlefield, including the mighty Achilles, whose combat prowess was the stuff of legend. In their fateful encounter, Paris managed to deliver a fatal blow to Achilles, striking him in the vulnerable heel and ending the hero's life. The death of Achilles marked a turning point in the war, as both sides mourned the loss of a legendary figure. Yet the conflict showed no signs of abating. With the Greeks continuing their relentless assault, and the Trojans determined to defend their homeland, the fate of Troy hung in the balance. As the war raged on, the gods themselves were not immune to the suffering and strife that had consumed the mortal realm. The divine beings who had once guided and shaped the destiny of heroes were now entangled in a cosmic struggle of their own, as the repercussions of their actions reverberated throughout the world. In the midst of this epic conflict, the destinies of mortals and gods converged in a complex tapestry of love, betrayal, and tragedy. The story of Troy and the heroes who fought within its walls would be remembered for generations to come, a testament to the enduring power of myth and the profound impact of the gods on the lives of mortals. And so, the Trojan War raged on. As the age of heroes neared its twilight, the epic sagas of ancient Greece unfolded their final, dramatic chapters, weaving tales of valor, tragedy, and redemption. Achilles, the mightiest of all Greek warriors, had withdrawn from the battle in a haze of grief and anger after the loss of his dearest friend, Patroclus. The Trojan prince Hector, seizing the opportunity, had slain Patroclus and sent shockwaves throughout the Greek camp with the ease of his victory. Achilles was consumed by anguish and rage. Determined to avenge his friend's death, he donned his legendary armor and charged back into the fray. Hector, noble and unyielding, stood his ground. Their fateful encounter ended with Hector's death, and Achilles dragged the Trojan prince's lifeless body in ignominious triumph around the walls of Troy. But the tides of destiny are inexorable, and even the fiercest heroes are bound by them. Priam, Hector's father and Troy's king, in an act of profound humility, came to Achilles under a flag of truce. 
he implored the Greek hero to return his son's body for a proper burial. Touched by the king's plea, Achilles relented, and for a brief moment, enmity gave way to humanity as Priam and Achilles shared in the grief that united them. Yet, the fate of Troy remained hanging in the balance. The city, once impregnable behind its mighty walls, now stood vulnerable. Inside its gates, Cassandra, the cursed prophetess, could do nothing but watch in terror as the Greek forces, led by crafty Odysseus, infiltrated the city under the cloak of darkness. The ominous warnings she sounded went unheeded. That night, the famous Trojan horse, a colossal wooden effigy, was left as a deceptive offering at the city gates. The Trojans, blinded by their victory celebrations, brought the colossal steed within the walls. Cassandra, driven to despair, urged them to set it ablaze, but her prophetic voice fell on deaf ears. As the city slumbered, the belly of the wooden beast disgorged a stealthy host of Greek warriors, including Odysseus, Menelaus, Diomedes, and Ajax. They had secretly infiltrated the city and, under the cover of darkness, flung open the city's gates to allow the Greek fleet, concealed behind a nearby island, to return. Troy's vaunted walls, which had withstood a decade of assaults, now faced betrayal from within. The once mighty city fell to ruin, and its streets ran with blood. The gods looked on, some with favor, some with sorrow, but none with the power or will to halt the course of mortal strife. Out of the fiery destruction emerged Aeneas, a Trojan hero of indomitable spirit, leading a small band of survivors. With the ashes of their homeland still smoldering, they embarked on an arduous journey, sailing across the Mediterranean. The shores of Italy would become their new home, and from their lineage, the great city of Rome would arise, destined to shape the course of human history. Agamemnon, the flawed and power-hungry leader of the Greeks, returned to Mycenae with newfound wealth and captives. Yet, his own family was far from intact. His wife, Clytemistra, had seethed with resentment during his absence, and her rage culminated in a merciless act. She orchestrated the murder of her husband, avenging the sacrifice of their daughter, Iphigenia. The house of Atreus, cursed for generations, was a cauldron of vengeance and despair. Orestes, their tormented son, would be haunted by his own terrible act for years to come. As for Odysseus, the resourceful hero whose wanderings had spanned a decade, he finally set sail for his beloved Ithaca after the fall of Troy. Yet, the unpredictable whims of the gods continued to test him. Storms and strange islands led him further astray from his homeland. The Cyclops Polyphemus, the malevolent sorceress Circe, the treacherous Sirens, and the perilous whirlpool of Charybdis and the six-headed Scylla all stood as harrowing trials in his path. Odysseus faced yet another ordeal when his men, driven by hunger and defiance, slaughtered the sacred cattle of the sun god Helios. Zeus, angered by their sacrilege, unleashed a devastating thunderbolt that shattered Odysseus's ship and cast him adrift for days in the open sea. After these harrowing trials, Odysseus found himself marooned on the island of the enchantress Calypso, who held him captive for seven years. In his heart, he longed for the wife he left behind, the ever-faithful Penelope. It was Athena, the goddess of wisdom and strategy, who interceded on Odysseus's behalf. She beseeched Zeus to release him from Calypso's clutches. Zeus, ever the arbiter of fate, agreed. With a makeshift raft, Odysseus set sail for home once more, buffeted by storms and currents. His journey brought him to the shores of Phaeacia, where he was discovered by the Phoenician princess Nausicaa. She clothed and fed the weary traveler and guided him to her father's palace. There, Odysseus found refuge and sanctuary, albeit in the guise of a nameless wanderer. In the palace of the Phaeacians, the renowned poet Demodocus regaled the court with songs of the gods and the fall of Troy. Odysseus, veiled in secrecy, was moved by the tales of his own odyssey. He disclosed his ten-year journey, the hardships endured, and the trials faced. Upon departing the Phaeacian shores, Odysseus arrived on the island of Ithaca, twenty years since he had left. With the guidance of Athena, he devised a shrewd plan to regain his kingdom and confront the hundred suitors who had laid claim to his home and wife in his absence. With the palace in chaos, Penelope devised a challenge for the suitors. 
she declared that she would marry the man who could string Odysseus's great bow and shoot an arrow through twelve axes, a feat that only Odysseus himself had ever accomplished. Odysseus, disguised as a beggar, stepped forward to take the challenge. He effortlessly strung the bow and, with a single arrow, sent it through the twelve axes with unmatched precision. The suitors, exposed as interlopers and condemned by their own treachery, met their grim fate. Finally, the hero and his beloved Penelope were reunited, their love tested and proven through years of longing and tribulation. As the age of heroes drew to a close, the divine drama that had raged across the heavens and the mortal realm began to fade. Zeus, the king of the gods, attempted one last act of divine creation, fashioning humanity from gold, silver, and bronze. Yet, the golden age of humanity could not be restored, and the age of iron was ushered in, an era marked by strife, hardship, and the relentless pursuit of knowledge, including the understanding of gravity. The age of gods and heroes had given way to the age of mortals, who, with resilience and curiosity, would forge their own destinies. The tales of Greek mythology endured as a testament to the enduring power of storytelling, capturing the essence of human existence in all its glory and imperfection. In the twilight of this extraordinary epoch, the heroes and gods of ancient Greece receded into the annals of time, leaving behind a legacy of courage, cunning, and the relentless pursuit of meaning in a world filled with both wonder and peril. Their stories, handed down through the ages, continued to inspire and captivate.